Thank you, and thank you for the opportunity to address this meeting. We heard this morning that human population densities are very high on the coast, and indeed in Europe, about a third of the population live within 50 kilometers of the sea. So it's hardly surprising that people share many different views about the use and conservation of the marine environment shaped by their political, ethical, and religious values. There's been a long-standing debate in Europe about the interplay between the use of the sea for fisheries and for marine conservation. And this has been catalyzed in many cases by high-profile state of the environment reports, such as the regular quality status reports that are published by the OSPA Commission. However, despite this debate, the predominant management paradigm has been one that's focused on exploited fish stocks. And really, conservation has been addressed as a series of patches on this framework. Um, an example, for example, would be the designation of cold water coral reefs for protection. This was really fitted into the fishery management framework, not a fundamental part of the management system. So what I'll dub today conventional fisheries management has focused primarily on the relationship between pressure, state, and response. The pressure being fishing mortality, the state being the biomass of fish in the sea, and the response being regulations and enforcement implemented by management agencies. And the hope is that through these responses, you modify pressure and therefore change the state of the environment to meet your objectives. And there are two fundamental assumptions in here that identify the credibility or the failure of science. First of all is, is the link between pressure and state real? If we take a management action that modifies pressure, does the state of the environment change predictably? And secondly, if we take a response with a view to achieving a change in pressure, does that work? Do the fishing industry and the people regulated within these systems behave and respond as expected? Progress towards meeting management objectives within this system has been assessed by comparing indicator values with reference points. And if you imagine fishing pressure rising in the marine environment and changing the state of a marine population, in effect, what the management system does is define a target reference point for the state of the population. And through science, you hope to identify a corresponding level of fishing pressure that's sustainable. And on this basis, you can assess whether your management is working or is failing in relation to the objectives that have been set. And that would be the basis for a description such as this of the state of UK fish stocks, which shows, as you can see, some improvement in status in relation to the reference point that management has set in recent years. However, we've seen over the last few years an absolutely fundamental change in the way the management system has evolved and we've moved from this simple pressure state response towards an ecosystem approach. This began really in a political sense with the World Summit on Sustainable Development in 2002 and subsequent to that a great many countries started to draw ecosystem-based concepts into their management systems and in effect that treated the aspects of sustainability that dealt with the economic system, the environmental system and the social system much more equi equitably and set out to achieve targets for all of them. And the main differentiation between this management system and the management system based solely on commercial fish stocks was that long-term considerations were paramount in this conceptualization of the management system that economic and social objectives would be met by taking decisions that ensured long-term environmental sustainability. And there were many challenges in Europe, which is my focus today, when moving towards an ecosystem approach to fisheries, particularly the low specificity and incompatibility of environmental, social, and economic objectives. I think all of society agrees that sustainability is a great thing, but the difficulties arrive when you have to make the operational trade-offs between social, environmental, and economic sustainability. 
Furthermore, within management systems like the existing and now being reformed iteration of the CFP, there was no explicit guidance on the priority to be given to objectives when trade-offs were being made. And this was a real challenge because in the absence of any decision laws, in effect it was a short-term political decision how these trade-offs would be made. And the trade-offs that resulted were often inconsistent. As a consequence of that, particularly in the European system, the decision-making became strongly influenced by short-term national interests. And that was epitomised by, for example, the Council of Ministers, who are typically very busy people making decisions about issues such as mesh sizes, that in many other management systems would be handled by a decision rule. And then finally, even if all parties in the debate could agree on where they wanted management to go, there was often low societal and political will to pay the high short-term transition costs. And that particularly meant reducing the amount of impact in the short term to bring long-term social, environmental and economic benefits. Within Europe, the biggest change that's now taking place in terms of moving us towards an ecosystem approach is the emergence of the Marine Strategy Framework Directive since 2008. And this actually now specifies the role of the CFP quite concisely. Firstly, that management measures um, can be taken with the CFP with a view to supporting the objectives of the Marine Strategy Framework Directive. And that means meeting targets for the environmental status of the marine environment. And secondly, that the CFP and the current reform of the CFP should take account of the objectives that have been set. And in a way, this moved us from a position where fisheries and stock status was central in management to fisheries management now having to deliver progress in relation to other aspects of the marine environment, particularly biological diversity, food webs, and seafloor integrity. These are so-called descriptors under the Strategy Framework Directive. And I should say today I'm going to focus on the Strategy Directive because it is the environmental pillar of the ecosystem approach within Commission policies, but it's important to note that it's seen under the umbrella of the wider maritime policy, which will also capture aspects of the social and environmental objectives that have been set for the environment. And in all those areas I mentioned, there have been concerns about the sustainability of impacts. So what does this mean in practical terms? Well, in effect, we've moved now from a system based on this linear pressure state response framework for fish stocks to a pressure state response framework that takes account of many more components and attributes in the marine environment, as summarised in this diagram. And where before we had indicators and targets that primarily judged the environmental successes within the management system in relation to targets for commercially exploited stocks, now targets are being set for many other states of the environments. And of course, there's an important thing about these targets for the other components and attributes of the marine ecosystem. That is that the target isn't really a scientific decision. A target is really an aspiration for society about how they want the world to look. And as a scientist, I think it's important, or as scientists mostly in this hall, it's important to recognise that we can't really define what those targets are. We can only inform society about the consequences of choosing different targets. And as a result, at the moment, while the debate is taking place right now about these targets, on the one hand, you have one set of views in society um, effectively wanting to move targets closer to unimpacted states. And on the other hand, you have other sectors of society who want to move the state of the environment towards something that would provide higher economic and social benefits. Science, as I say, can't provide the answers to where these targets should lie, but it can help inform the debate about the consequences of choosing different targets. So these targets for good environmental status under the Strategy Directive are still being defined. But I think one thing we can say is really since 2008, the policy framework to move towards an ecosystem approach to fisheries is more or less in place. And in fact, many of the analytical tools needed to provide evidence and advice are now emerging. And it's been wonderful, actually, watching the step change in science. I think for many years there was a scientific community 
carping and shouting about the way in which many wider ecosystem issues weren't considered in fisheries management. And actually, with the appearance of the strategy directive in Europe, it was a call to the scientific community to make themselves useful. And although initially they were caught in a way by the rapidity of policy change, I think they're now making the step changes that are needed to actually contribute in a meaningful way to delivering this objective. One of the greatest challenges, I think, for the scientists in supporting the ecosystem approach to fisheries is to provide evidence and advice on how to ex achieve these acceptable trade-offs between fishing and conservation. And this isn't about making the value judgment. This is about providing the technical tools in terms of marine spatial plans, in terms of technological developments in fishing gear, and so on, that will allow us to decouple some, for example, of the mortality rates that might affect a species that you want to catch within a fishery and the mortality rates on a species of conservation concern. And in practice, this is all about providing food and income and employment while protecting nature and ecosystem services. Because unfortunately, well, fortunately, society aspires to do both. But unfortunately for science, that's a very difficult challenge to address. One thing I want to say as I'm talking about this new future is that getting single species management right is still a very important first step in moving towards an ecosystem approach. And one good thing about this is that the additional measures needed will drop away as we move to achieving the targets for exploited stocks. And one thing we have certainly seen in many of our seas now is that even under the conventional management system, there is some significant control of fishing mortality rates taking place. And this, in a way, is great for the supporting science because I don't think it was an accident that many of the studies of the impacts of fishing on the ecosystem emerged at a time when fishing mortality rates, both in Europe and worldwide, were at historical maximums. And I think now we're starting to see those rates being passed and fishing mortality rates falling again that the number of difficult issues we will have to address will actually fall. And these effects are quite dramatic. The black line here is the average fishing mortality now in the North Sea um, on a mean basis for the demersal stocks, and it's fallen away. And even for some of the forage species at the base of the food chain, the fishing mortality rates are now falling away. And this is undoubtedly reducing the number of ecosystem issues that need to be addressed. So finally, I want to say something about the prospects for success um, and whether there is any potential. And I'll judge success here in meeting the objectives of an ecosystem approach as set by the policy process. Of course, we all have our own perspectives about what is success and failure. But if you like, I try to take a step back from that and talk about success in relation to the actual management objectives and targets that the management system has set. And if you like, after all, they are the targets that are democratically determined by societal and political processes. I think no one individual has a right to define what the right target should be. And I think prospects will depend on progress toward meeting management targets for exploited stocks, as I said. It will also depend on the choice of targets for good environmental status. Are they, if you like, what the conservation movement would call ambitious? That's close to unimpacted states, or are they targets that focus more on changing the marine environment to provide the highest rates of goods and services for humans, which those same people would regard as less ambitious? Obviously, where you make that choice determines the cost of the management you need to institute. Progress, as with single species management, will depend on the willingness and capacity of member states to withstand and pay for transition costs because moving towards long-term sustainability still has a high short-term cost if you're in a bad place at the present time. And then finally, from a scientific perspective, I think success is going to depend on the reliability of scientific evidence and models that link pressure and state. It's going to look extremely bad for the credibility of the scientific community if we take management measures that have a short-term social and economic cost on society and yet don't change states in the way we predict. And that's something we have to take very seriously when giving advice about the consequences of adopting different management actions and taking different targets.
This has been a short summary of a much wider piece of work, and I'd like to thank Jake Rice, ICES and CFAS colleagues for their inputs. And if you doubt my arguments or consider the case spurious, then um, you can see a bit more in the paper described. Thank you very much.